Dr. Brent Hendrickson earned his BA degree from the University of Northern Colorado in 1999, a master's degree from West Texas A&M University in 2002, and a PhD from East Carolina University in 2006. He's worked at uh, Millsaps College uh, since 2008, where he teaches courses in zoology, arthropod biology, evolution, and field biology. His research program focuses on systematics, taxonomy, evolution, biogeography, and conservation of arachnids, especially tarantulas and scorpions. He's published more than 20 articles on the biology of spiders and scorpions, and is currently working on a field guide to the scorpions of the United States. Um, in addition to that, um, He's always been so open to volunteer his time here at the museum, and you may have seen him at uh, events that you've uh, attended here. He's always really gracious and uh, brings in all kinds of spiders and scorpions and things that, that people love to see. So, so we thank him for that as well. But please help me welcome Dr. Britt Hendrickson. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, thank you for coming today. Um, yes, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about scorpions in the United States. Uh, it's one of these really enigmatic sort of critters that a lot of folks don't know a whole lot about. There's, there's a lot of misconceptions about them, so I'm hoping we can sort of squash some of those today as well. But I think at the end of the day, we, we need to figure out what is a scorpion, right? So scorpions are related to other arachnids. So we're all familiar with daddy long legs, spiders, ticks, those sorts of things. And there's also a lot of other types of arachnids, um, these bizarre cr critters that we can find in different places in the United States. So they're, they're what we call chlycerate arthropods. Um, and they're by far the most abundant, diverse group of terrestrial predators on our planet. So ecologically speaking, these things are incredibly important. Um, they're, you know, but when we look at these body plans of these, these scorpions, the first thing that really comes to mind is, is this. This is the business end of our scorpion, right? So th their abdomen has been modified into this tail-like structure that has a, a very hypodermic needle-like structure that's capable of delivering venom. So there are venom ducts and openings that can deliver venom. Inside of this large vesicle, there's large venom glands and muscles that will squeeze that venom um, into their unsuspecting prey, or maybe they are suspecting it. Um, so there's a little droplet of venom off of the, the, the talson of one of these spy, or scorpions. Now, one of the really cool things about this, I suppose, or maybe not cool, but uh, interesting things that, you know, this, this is kind of scary, right? You know, especially for folks that might not be very familiar with scorpions, and it's no surprise that Hollywood has made a lot of very unmemorable movies um, that are based on, uh, on scorpions and trying to really tap into to people's fears uh, of these animals. So this is uh, one of these blockbusters here, uh, the 1957, The Black Scorpion, where you have these gigantic scorpions that even tanks can't take down. <laughs> so uh, a lot of really interesting movies that have come out of that. Some of us are old enough to remember the old Clash of the Titans, right, with the large scorpions where the heroes fighting those things off. And of course, some more recent uh, <laughs> blockbusters here, Amphibious 3D and Mega Scorpions. I'm sure everyone paid their $10 to go to, to the movie theater to see these. These probably went straight to DVD, I imagine. Um, but I'm here to talk about scorpions. And so why am I interested in studying scorpions? And why should folks, I think, be interested in learning something about scorpions? Well, look at them. They're beautiful. They're fascinating. And they have this just brutal uh, anatomy, right? Any, everything about this animal says it's going to attack and eat, right? Uh, well, we've already talked about the business end of this animal right here. So those large stingers in the back that can deliver venom. But up front, they've got these two really large pinchers called pedipalps that are used for grasping and tearing their prey apart. And what's really fascinating about this morphology is that it has been conserved for hundreds of millions of years. So if we look um, at the fossil record, 
This, this image is a little difficult to read, but I can walk, walk you through this a little bit. I'm going to switch my pointer to a green one so we can see this a little bit better. But this is a geologic time scale right here going from the Cenozoic down to the Paleozoic. And if we just focus on the, the lineage of scorpions right here, so this is the fossil record for a variety of invertebrate animals. The fossil record for scorpions extends back to the Silurian period. So we're talking over 400 million years. Now the very first scorpions were actually aquatic. And this is a Silurian scorpion fossil right here found in an aquatic marine environment. But you can see when you look at that fossil, you know that is a scorpion, right? So that body plan, these living fossils that we see today is really, really interesting. When we're talking about the origins of various types of, of groups of animals, you know, this body plan has been incredibly successful for hundreds of millions of years. And it's no surprise given pinchy ends, stabby ends, those sorts of things, right? And if we look, you know, there are a lot of really fascinating scorpion fossils. One in particular is this one called Brontoscorpio anglicus, which is um, the largest known scorpion that's ever been recorded from the fossil record. This was a marine species, and the only part of the fossil that was available to study, this was in the early 1970s, was this big thing right here. That was the only fossil. And what this is, it's part of the, one of the fingers on the pinchers of, of scorpions. And based on comparisons to present day scorpions, so that's the same structure found in extant species, they were able to extrapolate the size of how large the scorpion might have been. And there are estimates about nine tenths of a meter, so we're talking close to three feet. So some of the largest scorpions in the world Thank goodness they were not terrestrial. Thank goodness they're not still around or this big, right? So really, really impressive predators that were patrolling these Silurian seas. Now, um, another reason that we can be interested in studying these things is from, again, from an ecological standpoint, these animals are incredibly important. Um, in terms of biomass and transfer of energy, and related sorts of things, these, these animals are, are, are very important. So they're, they're obviously predators. They're feeding on a lot of different things, including insects that we might find to be pests. We might not find crickets to be pests so much, but you probably don't want them jumping around your house. So they're eating those. But they're also eating a lot of other things that people might not like so much. Um, unfortunately, I do like these things, but spiders, People don't typically want spiders in their houses. Well, heck, have a, have a scorpion in there. Uh, feeding on those. Um, centipedes. And even these things, if you've heard of camel spiders before, it's another type of arachnid, really cool little predators. But these things are eating them. So they're really important predators from that standpoint. But they're not only feeding on invertebrates. Um, they're moving on up, right? They're, they're moving to the vertebrates as well. So this is a Central American uh, species right here feeding on, on a lizard. And probably more impressive is this large African scorpion right here, which is feeding on a venomous snake, a very large venomous snake, which I don't know if the scorpion was responsible for subduing and killing that snake, but this photograph was obtained of, of this uh, scorpion, highly toxic species, uh, feeding on this very venomous uh, a viper. Right? Uh, but of course, they're not only eating things, they're also being eaten. Right? There's a ton of biomass, ton of energy tied up in scorpions, so it's a really nice resource to feed on. Uh, these are some harvester ants. Uh, there's a species of harvester ant in Mississippi. Uh, they're very common and abundant and diverse in the southwestern part of the United States, uh, but they're known to take down scorpions. Um, there's a centipede flipping, the, flipping the, the game here, eating a scorpion right here. Spiders love scorpions. You get a scorpion into a spider's web, no contest. A uh, spider is going to win almost 100% of the time. So this is a large uh, Nephila species, which is related to the, the local um, banana spider that I, I, I think it's called. Um, this is a, a black widow feeding on a scorpion somewhere in California. So they're, 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 these scorpions are getting eaten all the time. And scorpions even have to watch out for themselves. Um, turns out that in a lot of different ecosystems, even adults, so they are cannibalistic and they'll also eat other species of scorpions. Um, but in various ecosystems, especially these large sand dune systems that we might encounter in the southwestern United States, the age structure 
of the scorpions actually determines the, the relative abundance and the timing of activity for a lot of species. So when the really big guys come out, all the little guys run away, right? So uh, it's, it's some really interesting ecological dynamics going on. But of course, I have to talk about the vertebrates as well. The vertebrates are, are chowing down on these things left and right as well. You know, Will, you probably appreciate this. <laughs> so we've got lizards, we've got snakes, we've got birds, all of them eating uh, scorpions. Of course, the mammals, we've got meerkats. Um, this is a grasshopper mouse, or, uh, an insectivorous uh, mammal from the southwestern United States. We've got bats, pallid bats, which are, are, are feeding on these large arthropods as well. Um, but of course, we're also mammals, right? So folks are, uh, are eating these. They're sort of considered a delicacy, nice uh, street item food. Uh, fried scorpions, you guys ever tried them? Yeah. I think it's kind of blasphemous myself. But, um, but yeah, fried scorpions, but you know, so people are eating these things. All right, so that's interesting. Maybe we should know something about what we're, you know, the food that we're eating. Um, but, you know, another good reason I think we should be studying scorpions or interested in them is, you know, from a conservation standpoint, um, I I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but habitat destruction is leading to the demise of a lot of species, including scorpions. Uh, there are a handful of species of scorpions that have been documented as being extinct, um, some that are critically endangered, and that can be from, you know, habitat destruction, but also other human activities, you know, again, we've already talked about skewering these things and feeding them to people, um, making novelty items, so we can even put some, you know, scorpions in a sucker, maybe make some paperweights, those would look nice on your desk, all right? Um, so these are, these are, you know, potentially problematic. These are arthropods. Uh, we usually think of arthropods being able to uh, flourish and, 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 and reproduce, right? And they can do that, and they can do that very well. But one interesting life history characteristic about scorpions is that they, unlike a lot of other arthropods, they invest a tremendous amount of time, energy, and effort into their offspring. Um, this is a large female scorpion that was collected from southern Arizona. And if you look really c uh, closely at her, she's got this membrane on the side of her body. It's really distended. And so all that different color that you see in there, those are all babies. They do not lay eggs. They give live birth, which is very unusual for an arthropod. And when those babies are born, she'll form a little cradle under her body. She deposits them, she picks them up. And then ultimately what happens, all those babies end up crawling on the mom's back. This is the same female a couple of days later uh, with all the babies that had, that had been born merging onto the mother's back. They actually have a placenta-like structure that they can, they can feed their embryos as they're developing inside. So there's a tremendous amount of energy and resources that go into relatively few offspring. Again, you might look at this as like, that's not relatively few offspring. But when you compare this to things like a lot of different species of spiders, um, other arthropods, the number of offspring that these things are producing is very, very small. And just look at some other individuals. This is a scorpion from the Santa Rita Mountains in southern uh, Arizona, again, you can see her membranes on the side of her body really distended. You can actually, I could see the stripes on the baby right there. This is her a couple of days later. Here's another one, large uh, species of Serodigitus from southwestern Utah. Again, you can see the babies. There they are. But there's a lot of energy invested into these. And in some cases, it turns out that the gestation period for some scorpions, not the ones in the United States, but some species, on the planet, the gestation period might be 18 months. That's double the time of a human. So again, if you're, a lot of people also like keeping these things as pets, so that's, that's gonna play into some of this as well. And so the exotic pet trade, really big. A lot of people like keeping cool, creepy crawlies as pets, right? So spiders and scorpions and snakes and other sorts of things that most people, eh. but there's, there's a market for this. There's a high, uh, a, a lot of scorpions that are kept as pets, and one in particular, one that you might be familiar with, known as the emperor scorpion. It's a large African scorpion, really charismatic, big, chunky claws, uh, pedipalps. Uh, these things get to eight, nine inches long, so it's a really big, fascinating-looking scorpion. Um, 
These have been collected in tremendous numbers um, and exported out of Africa, such that they've, also, they've recently been placed on CITES Appendix 2, which is so the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna, which is largely, um, it's not so much setting up protections for the species, but in order for the, the, the country of origin to export them out, there has to be a permitting process. So these populations of the scorpion, because they've been over harvested and over collected, they're being monitored more closely now um, to make sure that maybe the species doesn't end up going extinct simply because people want them as pets. Um, some recent data shows that a lot of the really big scorpions from these populations are very hard to find now. So in, in, in uh, Central and Western Africa where the scorpion is found, uh, if you go out there now, most of them are eh, that big. Very few large females. This is one of those species that takes 18 months to gestate. So if you're collecting all these wild females from their populations or before they're mature, putting them into personal collections, and given the fact that it's taken them so long to reproduce and they're not having tons of offspring, you can see how this can uh, create a, a problem in terms of their numbers. But maybe you don't care about scorpions that way. It's like, well, you know, why should we care about scorpions? Well, venoms, right? Venoms are these, you know, fantastic biomolecules that are just there. It's an untapped resource. We know so little about them. We know so little about what benefits they might be able to provide to humans. Um, a lot of recent research in various labs um, across the world has been looking at venoms for different types of treatments for a number of different um, human ailments, everything from cancer. Uh, we've got papers that are coming out that are dealing with understanding how scorpion venom causes pain. So understanding how these various toxins interact with our nervous systems um, to deal with pain so that we can develop new painkillers that might not be addictive. Um, also looking at you know, more ecological friendly mechanisms for producing pesticides. So looking at how these venoms specifically target in insects rather than targeting um, you know, other animal tissues, human tissues, so, so various types of pesticides that won't be harmful to us and won't bioaccumulate in, in humans as well. So those are things that, you know, when we think about scorpions, this is one of the reasons why perhaps we should be really invested and interested in their conservation because the you know, 2,000 plus species of scorpions on our planet, and we know virtually nothing about their venom chemistries. All right, so this is, one of, this is a really hot area of research right now. Um, but I'm here to talk about scorpions in the United States. Um, over the last two decades or so, uh, I, I've been invested in working on tarantulas. So I've been working on the genus Aphona palma, which is the only genus of tarantulas that are found in the United States. Um, my colleagues and I recently uh, revised this group, and we, we published a big uh, monograph last year that synthesizes all of the taxonomic, all the diversity information about these tarantulas in the United States. But I finished this. This was two decades of, of my life, and I was like, what am I going to do next? <laughs> so I needed to move and start doing something uh, new. So I wanted to work on scorpions. Before I do that, I do have to acknowledge a handful of students who've, who've done a lot of work with me, and they are in the audience. Hi, guys. Um, so this past summer, when a lot of this research began, a lot of the field work to go collect all the different species of scorpions in the United States so that I can go and photograph them um, and document other sorts of natural history information about them to go into this field guide that I'm wanting to produce. Um, I've got Aaron, Miranda, and Ashley. This, we're actually, this is a photo of us down in San Diego. We, we woke up super early to go down to the tide pools in uh, La Jolla Cove in San Diego, and uh, Miranda's holding a giant sea hare that we'd found in the tide pools out there. But we, were, we spent three weeks in the southwestern United States going out collecting scorpions um, for this project and various other sorts of projects. Um, but when we think about scorpions, especially in the United States, we're, we're generally thinking deserts, right? That's where the, the hugest diversity of scorpions in the United States is, and that's exactly where we can go look. Um, so all the major deserts of North America have scorpions. This is the Sonoran Desert. This is a photo just outside of Tucson. This is the Chihuahuan Desert right here along the Mexico. Uh, Texas border right here is the Rio Grande. Um, we're in Big Bend uh, State Park or Big Bend Ranch State Park collecting scorpions right there. 
Uh, this is a photo from the Mojave Desert in Southern California. So these are all areas where we've gone to go collect. But when we think you know, about deserts, yeah, there's a lot of scorpions there, but that's not the only type of habitat that we find them in. So if you come make your way to the Eastern United States, Longleaf pine savanna, palmetto scrub, uh, we, we've got a, a, a species that's found in that type of habitat in the area. Um, also these high elevation pine oak forests, mixed conifer forests that we find in different montane regions throughout uh, the southwestern United States. You know, so the, the number of habitats that these animals exploit is, is, is pretty um, significant. Now, when we go about trying to locate scorpions, you know, I guess the, 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 the limiting factor is how do you go and collect a scorpion? They've got pinchy ends and, and sticky ends, right? So you do have to be aware of, of, of potentially getting stung. Right, so that's, that's problematic. But also, how, how, how do you go find them? So most of the time, you know, during the day, we'll go out, we'll flip rocks. So this is a bank somewhere in southern New Mexico. Some rocks, we'll flip those over, hopefully find a scorpion underneath them. But that's a lot of labor, a lot of pain for very little reward. Now, the most fascinating thing about scorpions is that they come out at night. So most of the time, We'll get to a site during the day, and we just sit, and we wait. We wait for that sun to go down. This is actually a shot that I took um, from, from one of the mountain ranges surrounding Death Valley as the sun was setting, waiting for it to get dark enough for me to go out and start collecting some scorpions. Here's the Sonora Desert. Here's a Joshua Tree National Park where we're waiting for, for darkness to set. And the reason for that is because scorpions have a really, really cool characteristic. It's not a characteristic that biologists discovered. It's actually something that geologists discovered when they were looking for different minerals and rocks. They would use an ultraviolet light, much like this one here, shine it, and what, they, what these geologists were seeing was this. They were seeing scorpions <coughs> fluorescing under ultraviolet light. Every known species of scorpion that's living today exhibits this characteristic. You shine a black light on them and they glow. Here's an image of a scorpion that I took from uh, the Kelso Sand Dunes in Southern California. This is, uh, I don't know, this is from somewhere also in Southern California, but you can see that's a very rich, vivid color. Now, in fact, I wanna, I'm gonna take a scorpion out really quick um, so that you can see this. I think it should be dark enough for you to be able to see this as well. This is a large scorpion right here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of come over here a little bit and can you guys see that? So it's really cool. We go out in the field and we go armed with these lights because if you go out with just a headlamp, a lot of scorpions blend in really well with the sand and gravel and other sorts of habitats um, that are around there. But you go out with these black lights and they really stick out, literally. Um, from their surrounding environment. So we use, we use this characteristic here to be able to, um, to identify and find these scorpions. And some of these scorpions can be super abundant. Um, we, I've seen population densities as high as about two scorpions per square meter. And that's this species right here, which is a five, four and a half, five inch scorpion, seeing those population densities of about two per square meter. So a square meter is, about this size of this table, having two big scorpions, seeing them that dense in the environment. You know, it's pitch black and you shine that black light, it's like a constellation of stars shining on these, these sand dunes. It's absolutely incredible. And then you'll sometimes see a scorpion sticking out of their mouths or something because they're eating. So <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty cool, cool critters. Um, one of the questions I often get is why? Why do they do this? Now, we don't really know. Uh, but the, right now, the consensus is that, you know, function of fluorescence is, is a mystery, but some recent data does suggest that the fluorescence might play a role in them using their entire bodies as a photo, giant photoreceptor, giant eye, essentially. So it's thought that they might be taking the ultraviolet light and transducing it or converting it into this brilliant sort of cyan, blue-green color um, as they relay that information to their central nervous system for them to perceive light. These are nocturnal animals. Um, 
If they're exposed to light, that means they're exposed to potential predators. So they're, they're very sensitive to light. Their eyes are not very good. Um, there are, have been some studies that demonstrate that there are photoreceptors in their tails. Um, so it's thought that maybe this fluorescence is a byproduct of some unique um, ability for them to perceive even very faint amounts of ultraviolet light, even in the dark, even you know, from the moon and, and other ambient sources of UV light. Um, but this is still a lot of ongoing research. We still don't really know um, why they do this. Now, when we look at the scorpions in the United States, uh, we have a huge diversity of body sizes. So this is, we call this the, the desert hairy scorpion, Hadrurus arizonensis. Largest species in the United States, um, pretty common throughout the deserts of southern Arizona, California, and related species can be found in Utah, Nevada, um, Idaho, and adjacent portions of um, you know, western Colorado. But these get to about five, five, six inches, so you're talking close, up to 15 centimeters, 150 millimeters, the big scorpion. Um, so that's about the, the, as big as they get in the United States. And that emperor scorpion I talked about earlier does get bigger than these. But this is an impressive, in fact, the scorpion that I just had, on, had held on my hand was mm, sort of a teenager of one of these. So not quite full size. But we con contrast that to these little dudes right here. So this is a, a little um, rock crevice dwelling scorpion that reaches a body length of maybe 15 millimeters, so a little over half an inch. So we're, we're talking orders of magnitude and size difference. So pretty significant, and, and these big guys would easily make a meal out of those little guys, but you find them in completely different habitats, even though you can find them very close um, geographically in, in the Phoenix area in particular. So there's a lot of body size variation. There's a lot of um, um, diversity in terms of the lengths and proportions of their claws, their tails, and there's also a lot of uh, different what we call ecomorphotypes. So we have these different scorpions that are highly adapted to various types of substrates. Um, this particular group, we call these lithophiles. They're rock-loving species, which typically you can find these usually on these vertical sort of uh, rocky outcrops that have a lot of fractures and cracks in them. And these scorpions, this is a new species uh, from the Big Bend region of, of Texas, a species of Ceridigitus that uh, uh, some students and I found uh, over, the, over this past summer. But they'll, they'll dart in and out of these little rock cracks super fast. They have little adaptations to their claws and their feet that allow them to grip onto that. They have these elongated, <coughs> slender pedipalps that allow them to squeeze into these cracks a lot easier. So they have a lot of really cool adaptations that allow them to survive in there. Uh, this scorpion up top here is actually one of these large desert hairy scorpions that uh, we recently discovered that they like these rock cracks. We figured that a lot of the big scorpions would be living on the ground in burrows and that sort of thing, but some of these big scorpions are taking to these cracks up along these cliff faces and, and other structures as well. <coughs> Now on the flip side of that, we also have this uh, uh, subtype of scorpion that we call ultrasamophiles. These are sand-loving scorpions. They like these shifting, really loose sand dunes. And you can't see it in this image because it's blown out a little bit, um, but I'll just tell you what's supposed to, uh, what you're supposed to see. Along the legs right here, um, these ultrasamophilic species of scorpions, just like a lot of other sand-adapted animals, have some sort of structure that allows them to, to to easily run across the sand. So they have these really long hairs that work like a snowshoe almost. So it prevent, they're able to run along the surface of the sand uh, without sinking into it. So a lot of really cool adaptations. They're also, they tend to be very pale in color. They kind of blend in with the sand even though they're not out during the day, but they're still very pale colored. And they'll build these burrows. Um, They'll build these burrows in the sand, which are easily collapsible. You can see one in this little image right here as well. Uh, but the, they'll, they'll hang out in these burrows that kind of corkscrew down into the sand. They'll hang out there during the day and at night. They'll come out and start uh, feasting on little insects on each other. <clears throat> now, in the United States, in terms of the, 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 the classification, um, there are six currently recognized families of scorpions. Um, about 120, 130 different species. Um, 
Probably the most notorious of the scorpion families is the family Buthidae, which includes our bark scorpions. There's a monotypic genus, uh, the Superstitiona donensis, this, this, so a member of this particular family right here. Um, fairly common in the southwestern United States, but the, the group that I mostly want to spend time with is the family Vajovidae, which is by far the most common species in, or uh, group, the family, in the United States. Um, there are 20 plus genera within this particular family and well over 100 species, including a species that is found right here in Mississippi. Um, the common name for this scorpion is called the Southern Devil Scorpion. I cannot think of a more inappropriate name for an animal, but that is a common name that's been applied to this animal, the Vegivus carolinianus. Um, this particular species, it's a small, well, not so small, I just, I do have to know that this is not to scale with respect to the state of Mississippi, um, but there's a scorpion that is in the state that not a lot of people, again, realize that we have here. In fact, prior to my, me moving here in 2008, I didn't know there were scorpions in Mississippi. Um, it turns out that the scorpion is found, it's distributed, or its distribution, at least that we have our mind wrapped around, is three primary locations. It's probably more, been, it's probably more widespread, but no one's gone and looked for the thing. But we've got some scorpions distributed in the very southwestern corner of the state. I think it's Wilkinson County. Um, up near Tishomingo, up in the northeastern corner, and even in Meridian, uh, so just an hour and a half east of here. Um, the, the scorpions are really common out there. In fact, on Friday night, this past Friday, I, I drove out to Meridian specifically to go capture some scorpions for, for this talk, and uh, I did pretty well. So <laughs> I, was, I was out there uh, with my black light for, I started at 6.30, and by 6.45, that's what I had in my container. So these, these scorpions, are incredibly common, incredibly abundant um, in us. I think there's, a, there's close to 50 scorpions in there that I collect in a little over 15 minutes. Um, so very, very common. Uh, and I do have some of these that I'll show you at the end of the talk as well if you're interested in seeing what a, a Mississippi scorpion looks like. But this also is going to lead to where I'm going to start talking a little bit about some of the research, not just going out and collecting stuff, but what are we actually doing with some of this stuff? Um, so the scorpion's not just found in Mississippi, it actually has a pretty wide distribution and we can find them in a variety of rocky habitats and they especially like living at the base of pine trees that have a lot of flaky bark. So in habitats where you can find them, you can go out during the day, peel away bark at the base of pine trees and you might find a little scorpion. It's a lot easier to find them using black lights but you can find them fairly regularly and pretty easily uh, with black light as well. So these are some of the habitats uh, where these scorpions have been found but they do have a much wider distribution. So their distribution is really focused on the southeastern United States, denoted by this dotted line right here, with the center of their distribution sort of focused on the southern Appalachians. And what my uh, colleagues, I have colleagues in Connecticut and Colorado, uh, what we've been interested in is trying to understand, you know, we know that the, the history of the eastern United States is very old. The southern Appalachians are incredibly old mountains have a very rich history, rich diversity, and we're interested in asking questions about um, biogeography and understanding species delimitation, species boundaries in these scorpions. Now, given that they do have this incredibly wide distribution, and given that this area is very, very old, and given that we don't really know what this group of scorpions' closest relatives are, we had hypothesized that this actually might be a complex of what we call cryptic species, so a number of very similar, closely related species that are currently lumped together in one. And so what we did is we went out and we, we did a lot of sampling. So all these large dots right here represent locations where, where uh, my colleagues and I spent uh, a couple of weeks going out and collecting these uh, scorpions. All the white dots represent old uh, museum collection specimens. The black dots represent specimens that were collected but we didn't collect a lot of additional data from. So all the different colored uh, locations represent samples that we actually extracted and sequenced up their DNA and we built a phylogeny based on the, these genetic sequences. And to make a long story short, um, don't get bogged down with any of the details here. Look at the colors. The colors on the map indicate different uh, scorpions 
on this tree right here. So these little bars right here, the different colored bars, make reference to the different colors that we see on the map right here. What this tree is essentially telling us, without going into tremendous detail, is that we're actually a little surprised that there's actually very little genetic variation in this, uh, in this scorpion across its entire distribution. That was a very unexpected find, largely because we expected these scorpions to, I mean, they don't move very far, very fast. They're, they're only about an inch or so long. They don't walk very far. And so to have this incredibly huge distribution with very little genetic variation suggests that there's high levels of gene flow between these populations, which also suggests that this species is, is relatively young. There's not a lot of genetic variation in there. Um, we have this phylogeny right here sort of calibrated with respect to millions of years. And we do have a major sort of break in our genetic data that we, we've dated that back to about five million years ago. But within those branches that are sort of subtending that or, or branching off of that, there's not a lot of variation. And so it appears that this probably is just a single widely distributed species, but we're still trying to get our mind wrapped around these genetic patterns that we're recognizing right now. So we're, we're trying to understand the phylo, what we call the phylogeography of these scorpions, understanding the historical distributions, movement, and any historical events that might have helped shape the genetic variation that we see in these scorpions. So it's an ongoing project. We still have a lot of work to do. We have additional genes that we need to sequence that are going to tell us more of the story. But this is still a couple of years from us uh, being able to complete this and trying to unravel whether or not there actually might be multiple species. Um, now, the final thing that I want to talk about is, is another project um, that I have a student working on in the Santa Catalina Mountains, which is a group of mountain, or it's a mountain range just outside of Tucson, Arizona. And it's dealing with these scorpions that we call the Vegevus vorsi complex. It's a group of really closely related species that all look similar. Um, sorry, Lily and Lee. <laughs> um, so Lily and Lee, uh, you can wave. So Lillian Lee, she's uh, my current honors project, or honors project, <laughs> she's an honors student working on an honors project on this group of, of scorpions, and this is her uh, flipping some rocks in the Catalina Mountains looking for these scorpions, and again, it's a lot easier to go out with black lights, so I just like, you know, pose for this picture so I can put it in there. <laughs> but we, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Aaron and Ashley, I, I, I cut you guys out of that picture there, you guys probably remember that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so she's, she's been working on this project, and what we were really interested in is this group of, of scorpions distributed throughout these uh, various mountain ranges in southeastern Arizona. So in southern Arizona, it's, it's characterized by areas of desert and grassland with these big islands of, of forested mo montane regions. Um, this area right here, so this is the southeastern corner of Arizona with a number of different mountain ranges. And it turns out that each of these mountain ranges has their own endemic little brown scorpion species. So we've got a little brown one from that mountain range, a little brown one from that mountain range, a little brown one from that mountain range. Yeah. You guys kind of see where I'm going with this, right? So each of these mountain ranges have their, these little brown scorpions. They all look incredibly similar to each other, but they have been identified as different species or classified as different species. But the mountain range that's of real interest is this one right here, denoted by the yellow. Those are the Santa Catalina Mountains, uh, where if you're familiar with uh, Arizona geography, you've heard of Mount Lemmon, uh, which is one of the higher peaks in southeastern Arizona, a little over 9,000 feet. Um, that's an interesting place, and the reason it's interesting is because it's the only mountain range so far that we know about in southern Arizona that doesn't have just one of these little brown scorpions, at least as far as we know. So this is a map. There's, it's really nice because there's the highway. It's called the Catalina Highway. It winds its way from the valley in Tucson in typical Sonoran desert scrub. So when you think of the desert and the big iconic cacti, saguaro cactus, this highway starts there and it makes its way up to 9,000 feet in elevation in mixed conifer forest as if you were hanging out in British Columbia, Canada or something. So the, the biomes that are transversed on this highway are absolutely spectacular. Well, it turns out that in 2009, um, there was one of these little brown scorpions called Vegevus debore, which was described from a location 
called Willow Canyon, which was about 7,000 feet, a little above 7,000 feet in this Catalina Mountains. Man, I'd spent a lot of time in these mountains uh, since about 2000, and I, I'd collected the little brown scorpions all throughout these mountains. So I knew that these little brown scorpions could be found all throughout these areas. Well, a few years later, another species was described, Vegevus bryceni, another little brown scorpion from a location further uh, at a lower elevation, around 5,350 feet, um, in an area that isn't as densely overgrown with forest. It's a little more exposed. It's more, um, rather than being a, a pine forest that we find up at Willow Canyon, is more of what we call an oak grassland. It's drier, it's hotter, um, but there's this little brown scorpion described from there. Now, I wasn't buying it, so I've, I've spent my you know, the last 20 years of my life trying to figure out, understand the diversity of arachnids in our country. We have these two species that have been described. Turns out that these, these locations are only seven miles apart along this highway. So drive seven miles up, you climb uh, not quite 2,000 feet up, uh, set, you know, that, that separates those two locations. Well, because I knew that these scorpions exist in a lot of other places, what we went ahead and did is we went out and we had collected more scorpions wanting to understand whether or not there's gene flow connecting these populations. So we went out, we collected some scorpions a little higher up in this canyon, uh, close to 6,000 feet, and then we even went way up top to this place called uh, Palisades Visitor Center, about 8,000 feet, um, where the temperatures get really cold, um, there's snow that accumulates, and in case you don't think of snow in Arizona, uh, here's proof. This is um, Ashley and Aaron last May when we went to go do some field work for this project. We're at Palisades at 8,000 feet, and we were collecting scorpions in a sleet and snowstorm, flipping rocks and actually finding scorpions, which was fantastic. It's really cold, but um, high elevation that we're sort of dealing with here. So what we ended up doing, though, is we, we sequenced up DNA from these different populations, from these four localities, and this is what we eventually uh, what we found. Well, we found that all these scorpions from the Catalina Mountains were indeed more closely related to each other than they were to any other of those scorpions found on the other mountains. That was sort of an expected result. What was unexpected, because I was going into this thinking that we're probably dealing with a single species and these taxonomists did not do a very good job uh, teasing apart these species boundaries, um, what we found is that there are actually these two very distinct genetic lineages, divergent genetic lineages within this particular population uh, within this mountain range. So this made me raise my eyebrow a little bit. It's like, well, maybe there are potentially two species. Um, part of the problem with this is that there's been some, some issues in terms of the distribution of where these genetic groups are located within the mountains, which is creating some problems of figuring out what species are actually there. So if we go back to this map right here, um, it turns out, so all these individuals that were collected from seven cataracts, so this low elevation site, um, they're all highlighted in red right here. They're all genetically very similar to each other. That's a result that you would probably expect. These are probably individuals that are they're closely related, therefore genetically they're going to be very similar. Okay. We go a little higher up into the canyon to this um, middle bear area. It's a little hard to see the color, but these orange specimens right here are represented by samples that fall out right there. Well, that's kind of cool. So it's not too far from the original site where we'd collected some of those. They're all closely related to, so all the specimens from here that we sequenced, their DNA, is very similar to these things from down here. Okay, that's a satisfying result. Now we go higher up. Um, so we sequenced up some DNA from way up top, that eight thousand foot location and it turns out that those populations fall into that other genetic group. Okay, well that's kind of cool too. So we've got this low elevation thing and then we've got this high elevation thing. Well, one thing that we're also missing is, is a, a couple other locations that have been sampled. So we, I had this other location that we, there's a database that has some genetic data. I was able to pull that genetic data from the database. It's from a location called Rose Canyon, which is way up here. And it turns out that's grouping with this high elevation stuff as well. Okay, that's pretty neat. That's kind of what we're expecting. And then that, this Willow Canyon site, 
If you remember, the Willow Canyon site, that is the location for where, from where one of those species was described. Well, it turns out that the Willow Canyon specimens are falling into both of those major genetic lineages. So what does this mean to us? We're trying to figure this out. We're trying to determine whether or not this is indicative of maybe two different species that are experiencing secondary contact in this particular mountain range. And one of the big problems, those that are sort of familiar with systematics and taxonomy, because we've not been unable to obtain sequence data from the actual holotype specimen um, for, or for this one species that has been described from Willow Canyon, we don't know if the name should go to this group or if the name should go to that group right there. So it's creating a lot of challenges in terms of how we're able to recognize and name these different entities in the Santa Catalinas, which can have conservation implications and a number of other things as well. So this is also an ongoing project. Um, uh, Lillian Lee is going to be defending her thesis next Thursday, I think, Thursday afternoon, talking about this stuff. She's going to wow us, I'm sure. And uh, so, but we're, it's still very much ongoing. It's a sort of an unanswered question. It actually created a lot more questions. We thought this was going to be a very simple, clean project, but science is never that way. This data was very unpleasing, but exciting at the same time because it opens up a whole new path of, of research and questions for us. So it's, it's a pretty exciting result. Um, again, it's going to delay a publication potentially, but <laughs> I think the, new, the publication that results has a, has a lot of, it, of potential interest. So it could be really interesting. But anyway, that's where I sort of want to wrap stuff up. Um, I do just want to quickly thank uh, Millsaps College for funding a lot of the, the field work that I've done. And of course, uh, a number of students um, that have gone into the field with me. This is a group from my summer class that I teach every summer out in Arizona, sporting the Millsaps colors. Uh, this is uh, an area called uh, Cave Creek Canyon, the Chiricahua Mountains in southeastern Arizona. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize a few of these uh, folks uh, in the audience today. Had a good time. But uh, with that, I'll go ahead and, and, and be happy to take any of your questions that you might have. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. There, there are a few records from some other locations, but the, in terms of their primary distributions, those three locations in, in areas just outside of them. So there might, I think the Meridian locality in Lauderdale County, I think the county just south of Lauderdale County, I don't know what that county Clark. is, the Clark County, um, also has, has, a, has a record from there. There's a record from Mississippi State um, from a dorm room. <laughs> so that's, you know, between, you know, sort of fills in the distribution maybe, but we don't know if that's an introduced individual. But. So where at? Okay, yeah, so, so the, they probably have a much wider distribution in the state. Um, I'm unaware of them in the immediate area, so I have, I've not found them in the Jackson Metro. Um, but you know, no one's really looked for the things. Um, so yeah, well, it's still, still, uh, still, still, still a lot of work. Is that, is that those are the primary locations. Those are, so those are all based on published records that have already been published. So that's I went back to those areas just to confirm their presence. But we haven't done any extensive field work throughout the state to really determine if they're distributed throughout the entire state. Um, the genetic data suggests that they're probably a lot more <coughs> widespread. Um, so the genetic data, especially from the, the population that's from Wilkinson County, is actually very similar to stuff that we've collected near Tuscaloosa. So because there's very little genetic variation between those populations that are separated by a few hundred miles, um, that suggests that that's been a very recent event. So there's probably populations all the way in between. We just haven't done the sampling for it yet. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> yes, yeah, hi. Uh, what about the bark scorpions? Are they one of them that you would find under a tree? Is that what it's named at? Yeah, so it turns out, so interest, yeah, they, 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 bark scorpions are not one of these types of scorpions that have very specific habitat requirements. So they're not like the lithophiles that live in the rock cracks. They certainly can, but they're not exclusive to those. But one of the things they really like living under, yeah, barks of trees. And it turns out that there's a lot of introduced populations of 
the species that's found in like Texas, it's frequently found in places like North Carolina and other places that use mesquite wood for, for barbecue. Um, so when the mesquite trees are harvested, they're, they're hitching a ride with them and then there's these little locally established populations of bark scorpions throughout the country that aren't part of their normal distribution. Yeah. Yes, in back. You know, no one's no one's really looked at those types of questions to see. Yeah, you know, so that's yeah, so that's I think that's a, that's an important point. Um, very little, and that's I think one of the things that before we can really know about these differences, we kind of have to. My, my end of the research, since I don't do venom work, I don't have that expertise. You kind of need to know. We need to know what populations and what species we have. But yes, yeah, someone needs to come. In. We, we yeah so no that there's it's un I don't know of any reports of any scorpion um, transferring bacteria or viruses or any sort of parasite um, it's it's strictly venom that's that they're injecting as far as we know now that's not to say that a sting site like a, you know perhaps a staph bacterium or something could be on the stinger of a scorpion and it can be transferred that way. I don't know of any data that would support that. Right, 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 right. Yeah, they're not vectors of diseases. That's right. Okay, well, then it's so important. We know these little tiny technicalities are lower in the mountain than up in the mountain. So... Yeah, so, you know, one of the things is trying to figure out, just untangle the diversity, trying to understand the different um, groups that we have in these mountain ranges. Because what, that's the sort of the, 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 the first bit of research is untangling the diversity. So we can't really know what, you know, if there's any benefits to their venom, for example. If we're just going out and sampling these scorpions in, this, in the Catalina Mountains, for example, and we find a scorpion, we don't take note of where it came from, but we find that it has some interesting property to its venom. I'm totally making this up. But suppose that there is something really beneficial to that. Maybe it treats heart attacks. I don't know. Um, if, that, if that particular property only comes from that very specific lineage, then it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to, to worry about the, the scorpion from up top if we need to harvest more scorpions for venom. Does that make sense? So it's just, it's just understanding what diversity of the different organisms that we have in the first place. And just from a, from a non-application standpoint, I just think it's cool. <laughs> I'm interested in the diversity of the stuff. Yeah. Yes? Uh, with this long gestation period, what about their lifespan? So, uh, good question. So, lifespan of scorpions, uh, most of the species in the United States can live two, three years. Uh, we do have a handful of species, like these large desert hairy scorpions right here. These things can live in you know, upwards of 10 to 15 years. Um, the maximum age, probably in the 20s for some of the species. So, some of them are incredibly long-lived. Um, long gestation periods, but we do also have species that only live for a couple of years. So it's highly variable um, in a variety of different sort of life history strategies for these different groups of scorpions as well. Do they, once they drop off the mother, do they stay around? Or they, they, they disperse, yeah. In fact, if they stick around mama too long, uh, mama's going to eat them. <laughs> so it's a good way to, yeah, it's a good way to, to threaten them to go out and get a job, right? <laughs> it's not going to eat you if you don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> right. any, other, any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Um, so if, if anyone is interested, I do have uh, uh, four different species of scorpions from the United States. I'm going to go, I'll put them out on the table and we can look at them.